to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ Moses said to that new generation, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 5. We welcome you today to our study of the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by congregations and members of the Churches of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to learn more about God and, and His truth and His church, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in your local area. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. Visit our website thegospelofchrist.com. We've got a wide variety of good Bible study tools. We have CDs, DVDs, audio, video available, study questions and articles written on our website. Check that out and if you'd like to get a copy of any of those or a copy of today's lesson, we'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. Just visit our media request form on our website, fill that out and we'll put that to you in the mail. And friend, we want to encourage you to check out our apps for both Android and Apple, available from the respective Play Stores there. And that would be a great tool for your Bible study as well. Today we're thinking about the book of Deuteronomy. That big word, Deuteronomy, breaks down into really two English words which are pretty simple. It just means law again or second law. To the new generation, separate from those whose bodies perished in the wilderness because of sin, that new generation is now being raised up. Everyone 20 years old and above who survived, they need to hear God's law again, just like the prior generation did in Exodus 20 following, and yet with the hope that they will give more heed to the Word of God. And so the law of God, the law of Moses, is going to be given again to this new generation in the book of Deuteronomy, and the hope is that they will listen and obey that law and that they will hear and listen to God's statutes. Now, the book of Deuteronomy breaks down pretty easy into three categories throughout the book. Chapters 1 through 4, we have what we refer to as kind of a historical section. Tells everything of history-wise up to that point and recounts some of God's dealings with Israel. Then chapters 5 through 26 is the legal section or the legislative section of the book where God is going to recount His laws to this new generation. Then chapters 27 through 34, we have what we might say a prophetic section. God is going to give certain blessings and cursings and tell certain things that are going to transpire if the people will follow and adhere to God's law. And so while today we're not living in the age of the Mosaic law, while that law was nailed to the cross, Friend, because all of the Bible is the Word of God, there are some pretty powerful lessons that stand the test of time that we can learn from this book. As Romans 15, 4 says, the things that were written before time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might find hope. What lessons can we learn about God? and about God's dealings with man, and about how God wants us to respect Him and His law that we can take away from the book of Deuteronomy. The first and one of the most powerful lessons that we learn from Deuteronomy and that we will find recounted throughout history, even in the New Testament, is when God speaks His Word and when God gives His law or God gives His message, 
God doesn't want man to change that message or to mess with it. Listen to the words of Deuteronomy chapter 4 and notice what the Bible will say in verse number 2. The Word of God says in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2, You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And so Moses tells the people of Israel, don't change God's law. God's law is not up for edit. God doesn't need your help with it. When God says it, man just simply needs to obey God's law. And friend, there is such a practical truth that we need to hear today as well. The Bible, the Word of God, specifically for Christians, the New Testament is also not up for edit. God doesn't want us to change or to mess with His Word. Listen to the words of Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. God says, You shall not add to, nor take away from the Word. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, God says, Lest I add to you the plagues written in this book, or lest I take your name out of the book of life. Proverbs 30, verse 6, And the long ago the wise Solomon said that we're not to add to his word lest he rebuke us and we be found a liar. God has not changed. The Bible clearly says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8, God cannot lie. Hebrews 6, verse 18, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. And so when we think about God's law given to Old Testament people then, and God's law given to us today. Friend, that law is the final word, and we do not need to change that law. And here's why. It is that word which is going to be our final judge. Listen to the words of Christ in John 12, verse 48. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And so God's word is going to be our, our judge. God's word gives us hope and encouragement and, and tells us about how to live the best life and, and get to heaven. Why would we ever want to change or go back on that? The problem with this, though, is not necessarily the word of God. Oftentimes when we see people who want to try to change or render verses in Scripture differently, the problem is not necessarily with the Word of God. It's not the Word that needs to be changed usually, or it is not the Word that needs to be changed. It's people's lives that need to be changed. Just like in the book of Jeremiah chapter 37, where uh, the evil king there did not want to listen to the Word of God. Instead, eventually, he would take a penknife to the Scripture. Instead of trying to get angry with or change the Word of God, friend, we need to look to our own lives, and we need to see, is there something I need to change? Is there something I need to do differently? I don't like these verses because they don't align with things in my life, and thus, I need not try to change the Word of God. I need to look inwardly. Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. I need to look into the law of God, which is the perfect law of liberty, and the mirror of the soul, James 1, verses 22 through 25, and I need to let it reflect my life as it is, and if changes need to be made, well, friend, I need to make those changes. Then a very practical admonition in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is given to, to parents about putting God and His truth before their children at all times. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want you to notice beginning in verse number 5. God says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. 
You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And so when, when God speaks to Israel, the beginning verses, of course, were so well known to Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then that powerful statement, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, then he tells the parents, and here's what I want you to do with that. I want you to teach that to your children diligently. I want you to bind it as a sign on your hand. Put it as frontlets between your eyes. Put it on the doorpost of your house. What's God saying there? Keep it before you at all times. Make it available. Keep it out in the forefront. Make it what everyone sees and how you live your life. And thus the importance of bringing up our children as Paul would say in Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to, to help one's children to know God and to know the Word of God, what a powerful impact that can have on his life. Luke 1, verse 6 says of John the Baptist's parents, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, blameless. You know, when you think about people like John the Baptist, or you think about people like Timothy, what made them such good workers for the Lord? Well, both of those had a good raising. It was said of Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 12 through 15, that from a childhood he had known the Holy Scriptures, which, is, which were in his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. And Paul said, I'm persuaded, is in you as well. Who taught Timothy that? His mother, his grandmother, John the Baptist was given such a great head start by his parents. And friend, parents today, parents, grandparents, the best thing you can do for your children is to help them know God, that there is a God, that the Bible is His Word, that living by the Bible will bring you the best, happiest life you can ever have, and that being obedient to God is so much more important than so many other things that we make a priority in today's day and age. And so the encouragement to parents, put God out in front of you and your children always so that He can be the guide in the best way that you live your life by. And then I want you to think about, with that in mind, I want you to think about how Jesus also would use the Bible to help Him overcome temptation. Let me take your mind back to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus, as he begins his personal ministry, is uh, tempted by Satan. He's taken out in the wilderness. He's without food. He's there, the text tells us in Mark, with the wild beast, and he's tempted for 40 days. How in the world did Jesus overcome temptation when Satan is right there casting everything he's got before him? Well, Jesus uses the Old Testament. He uses specifically three passages from the book of Deuteronomy. Listen to those passages. Deuteronomy 6, verse number 13. Jesus quotes this and says, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him and shall take oaths in His name. Verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted Him in Massa. And then Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 3. He humbled you, allowed you to hunger, fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that He might make you to know that, listen to this, man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. You know, when Jesus was tempted by Satan those three times, He said, it is written. Then He quoted Deuteronomy. It is written, and he quoted another passage. And then that powerful passage in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, Satan tells, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. He, he was hungry. We know that. And Jesus so powerfully, when he quoted Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What do we learn about Jesus dealing with temptation? Friend, here's a very practical and powerful lesson. Jesus was able to defeat Satan 
and to overcome that temptation because he was so well acquainted with and familiar with God's Word that he could use that against the devil and as a defense uh, for that temptation. When I think of what Jesus did here, I can't help but think of the words of Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12, where the psalmist said, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Friend, we need to have such a good working knowledge of God and His Word that when temptation does arise, with that temptation, the Word of God comes up as well and it overpowers and reminds us of the truth to live by and not to give in to that temptation. Then as we continue our study in the book of Deuteronomy, we see some of the Lord's requirements for those who are going to be His children and live faithfully unto Him. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 10, and I want you to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 12. Here's God's law. The God says to Israel, And now Israel, what does the Lord God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him? to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes, which I commanded you today, for good. Well, what does God want of us? To love Him, to fear Him, to keep His commandments, to follow His law, which is only going to help us to have the best life that we ever could. Friend, God is not trying to keep us from having fun, God is not trying to keep us from doing certain things because He's just a mean and angry. No, God wants us to love Him. You know, when Jesus was asked in Mark chapter 12, and it reminds us again of the words of Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, when Jesus was asked by a student of the law in Mark chapter 12, what's the greatest commandment? Number one commandment, what is it? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Friend, that's what God really wants, is us to commit ourselves to follow Him, to love Him, to reverence and respect Him, and to live by His law in such a way that our lives will be blessed beyond measure. Friend, as we think about life in general, and as we think particularly about our own lives, think personally and ask yourself, am I really following what God required of His people then? and His people today. Do I really love God like I ought to? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do I really fear God? We're not talking about necessarily living in, in fear and trepidation of God is the idea, but do we reverence and respect? Do we give God the first place in our life that He really deserves? Are we following what God teaches in the Bible? As I look to my life and as you look to yours, friend, let's each be encouraged to do that. And if we're not, let's make the changes so that we can live in such a way that our lives truly will bring God the glory and the honor that He deserves. Now, as we think through some of the practical lessons in the book of Deuteronomy, I want us to see that long ago, as we study the Old Testament, I want us to see as much of Christ and what He did as we can in these lessons in the Old Testament because for sure that applies to a Christian. I want you to see in Deuteronomy 21, I hope you got your Bible and you'll look at this verse, long ago the book of Deuteronomy predicted the curse of the cross. Look in Deuteronomy 21. I want you to look in verses 22 and 23. Look at this prophetic statement in Deuteronomy 21 beginning in verse 22. The Bible says, If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now listen to this. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Now, thinking about the laws that God has just given in chapters, about chapter 6 through 25, 
You've got a lot of legal uh, prescriptions given there. And some of those violations of God's law would mean that people would be put to death because of that sin. And yet specifically mentioned here is anyone who's hanged on a tree. If you remember correctly, 1 Peter 2, verse 24, the Bible says of Jesus, He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree. Now, thinking about what's mentioned in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23, I want you to listen to Paul reference this exact verse in Galatians chapter 3, and notice what he says in verse number 10. The Bible says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. What do you mean? For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. And so the basic gist here is anyone who didn't obey God's law was cursed. All of us have sinned, right? Romans 3.23, and so all of us are under the penalty and the condemnation of sin. We deserve spiritually to suffer for that. Now watch verse 13. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things written therein. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Having become a curse for us, and then he quotes Deuteronomy 21, 23. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Friend, we've got to see Christ and God's great plan of redemption in the Old Testament. That passage talking about people who didn't obey God's law in Deuteronomy 21, 23, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus when He went to the cross. He bore our sins in His own body. God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 21, when Christ cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, friend, I'm the reason and you're the reason. He took the sins of the world in His own body so that we could have the hope of eternal life. You know, one of the more well-known passages also in the book of Deuteronomy speaks to people who try to say things and claim those things on behalf or on behalf of God when they're really not. One of the greatest passages about false prophets is also found in the book of Deuteronomy and this will be mentioned in the New Testament as well. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and I want you to notice what the scripture says in verse 15 following. God promised a great prophet was coming. He said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. According to all you desired of the Lord, your God in Horeb, in the day of assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command you. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Of course, as we turn to the New Testament, in Acts chapter 3, verse 22, this prophet is specifically identified here and in other places as Jesus. And so they said, the voice of God scared us. We don't want to hear that again. Raise up a prophet. And God said, I'm going to raise up a prophet. And whatever he says, you'll hear in all things. And of course, that ultimate, the prophet, the ultimate prophet is Jesus Christ mentioned in the New Testament. But what about all these people who claim to be prophets? Well, God addresses that as well. Look in Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? How do we know if this is God or just the prophet, or just somebody speaking? Well, here's how. Verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, 
If the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And so they said, God, we hear what you're saying, but how are we going to know if this is your prophet or if this is just somebody out there making something up? And God says, when he prophesies, here's how you can know. My prophets, what they say always comes to pass. These other guys, when they say it, if it doesn't happen, you can know that isn't from me. Well, friend, there's the litmus test for a true prophet of God. You've seen it throughout history. People will say, God's going to do this on such and such day. And in, in our day and age today, people are prone to say something like, the Lord has told me He's coming back on this day, 1950, June 3rd, 1957, or whatever the day may have been. And you can look back through history, all these prophets of false denominational teachings, they will prophesy this is going to happen on this day, and the next day you can know for sure. When it didn't happen, they're not a prophet of God. Friend, as you think about God and His Word, we have what we need in the Bible. God's given us all things for life and godliness in the Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. I don't live in fear of somebody out there prophesying this or that. I've got the Bible to go by, and I can know what God wants me to do to be a child of His. And so we hope today these lessons from the book of Deuteronomy have been an encouragement and a strength to help each one of us to live for God and live for Christ every day. Friend, as always, if you're not a child of God, you're not a New Testament Christian, we want to encourage you to become one. Have you heard the message that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Acts chapter 2, verse number 36? Do you believe with all your heart that He is the way the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. John 14, 6, John 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to turn from things in your life that are wrong and turn to God in repentance? Acts 3, verse 19. Would you confess the name of Christ before men? Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And to get into Christ, would you be immersed in water? Galatians 3 verse 27 says, As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. And the Lord Himself said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. We hope and pray today that if you're not a child of God, you'll become one and that each one of us will be encouraged to live faithful to death each and every day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.